city of New Mexico, and my partner Brett and I did a conference on cosmic communication, and I got into it because uh, my journey into the weird kind of starts with the fact that uh, I was, well, I suppose the first like thing that really starts everything off is that uh, between the ages of about three and ten, I was legally blind. So I couldn't pack, practically see past my nose. So I had to tune into the world in sort of a different way. Um, later, I realized that uh, my parents did not understand that as soon as I got glasses, I could read. Like, I was five. I got, they found out I couldn't see past my nose. They got glasses for me. I, I could immediately read because later I realized I was looking at the book through the eyes of my father. I could, like, mentally project. <laughs> into other people's perspectives, um, and so that was that was an early interesting experience. And I found out throughout my life I had been doing it kind of unconsciously because um, it wasn't it wasn't so much like it was more of an impression, like it was the knowing, like I knew what was happening from from their perspective. And mm. then the next the next big thing that happens to me at five years old, I had this experience where. I guess I was asked to pick a side, you know, team dark or team light. I was kind of asked to pick a side, and, and I said, you know, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to go for the light. I'm going to be uh, try to do a, be a good person. And it's interesting that I made that commitment at five because they didn't realize that at seven years of age, two years later, I was literally going to be confronting a program that was in the clandestine government where they were looking for psychic children. And I, I got probably the most information about it uh, as far as uh, recruitment of children for programs from our mutual friend, Andrew Bushago, um came out with his story about being a participant in Project Pegasus, uh, which was teleportation and then later uh, time travel and then later he jumped room to Mars. And I I am exactly the same age as Andrew. So I'm in, he said he called me a cohort. So I'm in the cohort of people who were in recruitment for programs. So when I went to the California, I was at the Conquer California, I went to get tested to be in the program. By then I had my glasses, like sort of thing. And, um, the testing just got more and more involved. I mean, uh, uh, they were they were testing me more than like you know, like they really were examining who I was, and they placed me in the gifted in talented program. And uh, it was under a program, an overarching program called Program uh, Project Talent. Um, and the sort of the idea of it was to we were in the Cold War era, we were in the NASA era, we were in the we wanted to upgrade our science and technology and STEM. That was a big STEM season, you know, back before we gave it that acronym, uh, science, technology, all that stuff. Um, so they, the front lines, like, presentation, let's find these kids, let's get them, make sure that they get math and science, make sure they go to college, and we'll have the workers that we need for the space age future. But the, behind the scenes, thing that was going on that I've been doing quite a bit of research on is that they were looking for also psychic children for a number of different kinds of programs, but probably your audience is familiar with this, the uh, super soldier type program. Um, because at the time that, you know, after the uh, World War II and all that was going on, we just segued right into the Cold War with Russia my, my dad was into this politically. He said the commies. The commies are coming, you know. He was into the commies <laughs> and uh, was talking about that all the time and had meetings in our homes. So I, I had a, a, a whole input there about the, what, what was the situation of the world. And I decided this is a really dangerous world. I may have maybe even said in my head, planet, you know. Like, I'm an alien. I just came to visit, and maybe I didn't like riding it up. <laughs> So anyway, I got tested for this program, and I got put into the classroom, and I tell people this one story because I've been fascinated at, as soon as reported back to me that this happened to them, oh, my test, oh, one of my, what? excuse me, 
phone call try to come through. I'm cutting it off. Hey, why do people want to call me now? <laughs> uh, yes, you're on the radio. I because I'm popular. It happens to be Ken Johnston, our friend Ken Johnston, <laughs> by the way, everybody oh, knows who he is. That's ironic. I just I just typed his name into my phone here <laughs> to talk to Victoria. Oh. Well, uh, from well, he, just, he just called yes. me. He's trying to call me. So that's really he's psychic, I guess. He's a psychic. So we're all but anyway, psychic. Yes. yes. I know. I know. So yeah, so anyway, so a couple things happened that I try to tell people about that recruitment is uh one day, I was like a like a little suspect. Hello. Hello. Uh oh. Hello, Karen. Hello. Is she off? No, she's still showing on. Still showing here. Well, now oh, she she's fell off. Now she, can you get her back on, please? <laughs> I got to wait for her to disappear in the conversation for her. Oh, then she'll disappear, and then we can go get her again. Oh man. <laughs> so let's erase that. <laughs> and anyway, um, that was ironic because I was just, um, I just got a, an email and I just typed in Ken Johnson's name and she gets a call from Ken Johnson at that precise moment. We're having a lot more of those uh, synchronicities in life. Uh, what do you think it's that is, honey? These people that we're interviewing on the show and the others that we've interviewed have been designated okay. as ambassadors to higher Hello. consciousness. are here to help She's us. She's back. Yes, okay. yes. So, okay. yes, keep going. So, I, I, get, so I, uh, I'm just a nerd old child doing my thing, trying to be a good kid. Get called in the vice principal's office, which, you know, struck terror in the heart of any child. Uh, and I and I was brought into the office, and the vice principal wasn't actually there. Uh, sitting in his office was a, a very pro professorial-looking gentleman. I perceived he was not a school official, actually, um, wearing kind of a frumpy tweed suit and uh, had glasses that he looked, uh, you know, just like he looked over the top of his glasses at me like it was kind of an experiment or a bug or something. I don't know what his deal was. Um, but a couple of things he did was he proceeded to give me a full psychological profile. And mind you, I'm seven, you know. I have not really had a lot of life experiences. But he gives me the full uh, enchilada psychological profile with the Rosarch uh, ink blot tests and all kinds of questions. And I, I forgot this for a long time. And then one day I remembered this, that this happened to me twice. I was tested mm -hmm. with Zenner cards. And Zenner cards are these uh, cards People see them, you know, sometimes in uh, TV shows and whatnot, and they have archetypal images on them. So, like a circle, a mm -hmm. square, wavy lines, a triangle, etc. And I had mm -hmm. a little map in front of me, and what he wanted me to do was was guess which card was going to come up next on the deck and, and point to it on the map. So he did a couple of them with me, maybe four or five, and I think I didn't do too bad. I was happy with that. Then he didn't show them to me anymore. He just wrote notes down. So what do you think this one is? What do you think that one is, you know? Um, and then I was put in this other uh, class, and uh, it got a little odd. It was not reading, writing, and arithmetic at that point. It was uh, a lot of thinking questions. It was a lot of, uh, uh, I felt a little bit like they were waiting us to come to certain answers. Um, I felt like they were trying to figure out who we were and asking us a lot of questions about, you know, what, what we thought of things in our perception. Um, our nap time, you know, we got graham crackers and a glass of milk, and uh, we laid out our little mat. And we actually were put to gui guided imagery, so <laughs> just, you know, take a nap. It was, we actually imagined you're by the seashore and, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and I basically felt like I got hypnotized a number of times in that situation. Well, it all of this happened without my aforementioned parents who were kind of paranoid of a lot of things, uh, of permission or knowledge. There'd been a mix up among the permission slip. They sent the permission slip home with me somehow. I forgot to get it signed. I sent it back in my little, you know, lunchbox or whatever, took it back unsigned. Okay, so, I, I, you know, maybe I didn't understand the whole concept of information slip at that age. But anyway, 
my parents got alarmed when I told them about what was happening, and they went and confronted the school officials. And the school officials were like, oh, we need to deal with these problem parents that don't understand their, how smart their child is. A lot of flattery involved in that class, by the way. And so it was kind of a tug of war between me and the, the officials. And my mom asked me one time, she said, what, what for her one time when she asked me, honey, do you know what's happening? And I said, yeah, uh, you and the uh, school officials are playing chess and I'm the pawn. <laughs> they want me to play. And there's, wow. there's a lot to there, yeah. There's a lot to that story, but uh, but I definitely when I began to I realized I didn't want to talk to the grownups about any of the, any of the grownups. I got I just shut my mouth and kept my counsel because I I was suspecting something was up. When I stopped yeah. doing that, they encouraged me to befriend uh, a, a girl my age, and uh, later, based on what she said to me about a lot of. Uh, unfortunately, these programs involve a lot of sexual abuse and abuse that, you know, is part mm -hmm. of this uh, whole thing that's coming out about Hollywood and everything. And she told me some things that had happened to her, but it was weird the way she told it to me. It wasn't like this was bad. It was like this was good. You you learn things from this experience. So it was a little mm -hmm. creepy. And um, I figured out that she was in the Monarch program. And one of the telltale signs that I knew that was true was they suddenly moved into my neighborhood from China Lake, California, where her father was stationed. And that was a big intelligence center uh, where a lot of mind control studies were done in China Lake, California. And then um, as soon as I withdrew from the program my parents put me in, uh, I went from uh, that whole situation to Baptist to school with school uniforms and everything. It was a really weird transition. Uh, but yeah, after I got put into parochial school, uh, then they moved back to China Lake. It was almost like they moved out to, for her to meet me and talk to me. And then how I kind of know that's probably true is I completely lost touch with her. We were pen pals for a while. I moved to a completely different state. And after, I, well, I kept having triggering events when I took the standard achievement test. It usually scored pretty high. She actually contacted me. Like years and years and years later, there's, I don't know how she could have possibly gotten my address. Uh, you know, I mean, you would have had to be an intelligence officer to find us because we didn't exactly, because of my parents' political activities and what happened in the school and everything. Uh, and there was a kidnap to something near my brother as well. Um, it just was hopefully yeah. weird there in California. I've now talked to quite a few, my, my partner Brett and I call, I call a shepherd. He was a program kid too. We just talked to a lot of program kids. And so they were kids that were in recruitment or fully went into programs, or were traffic. There was the uh, child trafficking, unfortunately, involved in this. Um, and so it's, yeah, it was kind of a, 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 a lot to think about. And then what I just did was I put it out of my mind. I just said, okay, I, I just want to be a normal kid and have a normal life, kind of. And I just said, I, I'm not going to think about this anymore. So I finished my school career. Uh, with, when I took the seventh grade test, there was another kidnap attempt. When I took the twelfth grade test, um, uh, there's a whole saga by itself. But basically, I felt like I was kind of monitored, you know. We, we got to do something with her. So what happened? This is interesting. Was I knew they had to kind of do something about me. I wasn't just going to go into the quiet night and just, you know, live my life. I was a little bit too, uh, you know, I, could, I couldn't do remote viewing. I think they were trying to figure out, hey, is she a remote viewer? But I couldn't see past my nose. So my viewing, the whole viewing, <laughs> part of my brain didn't function that, you know, I'd run into stuff. So, you know, I wasn't that visual. But I, ha I did with remote knowing. And so I, I developed what I later learned to call uh, I, my in, uh, instruct or mentor, I guess you call it, our board and talked about having no visibility or the knowing. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. That is what I learned to do, and then I didn't know what it was called, and it was later on that I, you know, began to discover what this was and what I was doing. And then uh, I was having occasional contact with uh, other beings, but I went really hardcore into my religious, you know, part of my life, and I, I was afraid of that, so I kind of pushed all of that way, and I, I just had information coming in. And it was always about the planet, like what was going on with the planet. But my parents being global, politically aware about, you know, all the things, you know, 
going on in, uh, in the world. I, my, my, I learned about the Bilderbergers and the, you know, the uh, Federal Reserve and uh, the, the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm like a little kid and I'm hearing this in my house. So I'm learning about the, the financial, what's going on. Um, and my dad constantly pointed out on the news with, you know, how they use trigger words to, to kind of say something like the idea of a conspiracy theorist was made up by um, the CIA to make people who had questions about the JFK uh, assassination and other types of things to make them look crazy, um, rather than being, you know, a conspiracy analyst, you know, let's replace that term, you know. Yeah. So, that's kind of my early childhood, and it was it was the uh, lesson and question. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, apparently, wow. there was a program called Project Talent where they were looking for people. And the more I interview people, the more we are finding um, young people recruited at a very early age. They're looking for psychic abilities and abilities beyond the norm. I had, um, I forget which one of my people that I interviewed, uh, she said that they actually are seeking the meta, the meta gene. There's Penny Bradley. There's Penny Bradley. Yes, Penny Bradley, right. And so when well, I was uh, younger, I flipped a chair. No, my mother flipped a chair, a big overstuffed chair, so that she had the metagene. And then uh, when I got older and, and this guy was trying to beat me up or kill me, I basically, with no martial arts or any formal instruction, I, I, I got him down on the ground. I was on top of him. But I went black for a while. I didn't remember what happened, you know. And then I came to or came back, whatever I did, and I was on top of the man, and I had my I had him by the, his collar, and he was shocked, like, how did you do that? And I don't know how I did that. But apparently there are people that have abilities. Um, I was in a project called Project Stargate, and I'm still finding out about that, but that was the... Uh, oh, do anything similar to what you're being tested for. Somebody's making noise. Stop making noise. <laughs> so, um, Sasha, did you have a comment or question before we go to uh, the next thing? No, it's just this. Uh, this is. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen. It's incredible that you've come out the uh, the other side. Uh, and uh, I guess for me, the big question is, can people, you know, that are so clear as you reach back to the people that are entrapped, uh, you know, the people we love, can we bridge the gulf and uh, uh, empathize in a way that helps uh, heal this planet? You know, you're channeling Gaia. It's so apparent to me. That's the big voice that you speak from. That's what I hear. Thank you for asking that question. Well, first of all, I I have to say, I've appreciated so many people along the way getting me the information to put this puzzle together. You guys were a big part of that. I was just talking to somebody the other day about uh, on the speaker platform. You were going to look at the first show I listened to. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I got the whole Anunnaki story. It was really important to me. I am an Anunnaki contactee. Um, I just appreciate people who've shared their experiences because that's really difficult to do. I, had, I came out with my experiences starting in 2012. I figured, hey, if it's a year that you're going to do that, it might as well be that year, you know. But I uh, mm -hmm. sublimated a lot of, it, of my experiences. I was involved in a cult within a church, so it was a little bit tricky to talk about, but I was in a Christian denomination that I grew up in, and within it was uh, sort of an inner circle group that had a cult-like tendencies, and it, it, that church actually split off a cult. And when I was at the, I was there when it happened. This is this is one of my features of my life to give me experiential knowledge. Is that I'm kind of like the Forrest Gump of this stuff. I'm always at the right place at the right time to observe something, and go, oh wait a minute, that's you know I was uh, there when uh, this cult thing started, and I do believe it was connected with the government. A lot of people, just, you know, we, we think of long gunmen or cults or people under mind control. We don't realize that there's kind of a program here. You know, there's kind of a plan. Uh, to, I just heard Bill Burns talking about how um, they were talking about uh, Project Monarch and all of that because they wanted to deprogram, I guess, 
we had in the Korea era, which unfortunately I lost my grandfather during that, in the Korea War, there was uh, some prisoners who were American prisoners, and they were, uh, they switched these American prisoners with um, uh, Russian prisoners, and they were going to make them super agents against some of the United States. And so he said, Project Monarch uh, was so that we could, you know, find out who these people were and deprogram them. And, and I have a lot of respect for Bill Burns, but baloney, I don't believe that for a minute. It's hard to accept the fact that our country, uh, maybe not so much now as it was in earlier years, we're now seeing something is really wrong with the meta level of America. There's something wrong at the top with our leadership. There's something wrong with the way we all, you know, fight and bite at each other. Um, when we really all kind of want the same thing. And so I think something, and of course we have the media, it's such a domination of our society in ways that it probably, it's always been, but even more so now. It's like something's going mm -hmm. on. And I, I think that they were, you know, first of all, when they had project paper clips, and this is kind of where I, I would say it starts, uh, it's a marker, you know, it starts earlier than that, because I would say deep politics, deep religion, uh, there's a lot of that that already has my control kind of built in. And, you know, I, I would have people that possibly would be listening, please understand, yes, I was listening to my but I am doing my deprogramming. Are you doing yours? <laughs> you know, people go, oh, I don't listen to that guy because they were under my control. Um, well, did you hear that on TV? <laughs> you know, um, it bothers me when people dismiss somebody because they admit uh, that they became aware of what they, that they were involved in. And the thing is, it's, it's hitting us on all cylinders in every aspect of society. So the main thing for yeah. us to keep in mind is to deprogram ourselves and the goal here is to become a self-actualized person, to become an, a, a sovereign integral, which is a wonderful term you get from the Wingmakers material. Sovereign integral. It means that you're mm -hmm. a holarchic being. You're you're a whole and being, but you're also part of everything. Oh. And so as you go, yeah, if you go towards that, you'll really fluff off a lot of nonsense. I think. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, you could just say those biases. Two or three sentences again. It's just incredibly uplifting to hear that. Well, the thing that was uh, kind of clear to me, and, and I, I talked about this uh, on that cosmic communication, is that we've had the mind control is construct a, 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 a thought form mind prison. And in the shape of it, it literally has a shape. It's a pyramid. It's, I call it the pyramid of power. And at the top of all pyramids, the city top of the pyramid is called the pyramidion. And a pyramidion are, are, are we, 1%, our rulers, our billionaires, it's the people who kind of run everything. And then they want us to fall somewhere in, uh, in line on that pyramid at some level. It's, it's about levels, it's about there's a top and there's a bottom. And, uh, and, but what the sovereign integral is a Merkava. So if you look at it as sacred geometry, and I know you guys talk about that, it's a pyramid. One pyramid up is the male principle, and one another pyramid, counter rotating pyramid, is the female principle in balance of one another. And that is the, the image of the sovereign integral that is that we are all. Uh, individually connected to source and individually being who and what we are uh but we're, we're whole within ourselves and this is what all the pyramid of power people want to take you off of they want you to be timid and, and afraid and unsure of yourself and unsure of your thoughts uh you know again a lot of uh, are you sure and what about when i talk to people who i know are struggling with their program they'll go I'll say, uh, well, the Anunnaki came here and influenced our politics of our planet. And they'll be like, are you sure? Where'd you get that information? You know, it's just they're picking it apart, you know. And then uh, uh, then they'll do what about? Well, what about this? And what about that? And, you know, I mean, I'll do some of that with people, but mostly I've, I've got to stick to my ground because it's kind of like, I've, I've looked into this and you can take it or leave it. If it works for you and resonates, great. If it doesn't, don't worry about it, you know. Um, because we need to think our own thoughts. We're here to have a human experience and to, to experience things as a human, to have our observations, uh, to learn, to grow, to try stuff. Um, you know, when I was kind of coming out of religion, go ahead. 
listen, listen. I'm telling you, uh, Karen. I, if the audience can feel you as well as I can, I hear you telling the real truth right from the heart, right from the highest level, and I'm just awestruck at how beautifully you bring us to that kind of consciousness. Just, just by your words. Thank you so much. Well, the other part of my life experience that, that taught me a lot was that uh, I have three children and my youngest child was born with a, a list of disability issues, primarily uh, hydrocephalus. She had hydrocephalus hispoina bifida, which she had to have her spine operated on at birth. And mm. she's my teacher, and I learned to from her, and, you know, people that in your pyramid of power would be at the bottom, right? They would be the most needy and the... And some people are rude enough to say useless eaters, which is a horrifying, you know, term. But these are people who, you know, when we flip that pyramid around and we say that, that uh, you know, the, the, all of the services, the people who talk need to be the services of the people at the bottom, and that the people at the bottom, as you want to call it that, are teachers to everybody. So we've got to mm-hmm. really revalue evaluate how we value people and a big part of uh, what was going on with these programs was the transhumanism agenda kind of says human it's kind of saying we're not very strong or smart as humans we need to have something else added you know um, and uh, I think our we've maybe dumbed down our physicality and our mental capacity but I think actually the human uh, uh, instrument, the human instrument, if you use it as a tool, uh, all the ways that it could be used, is very underutilized and undervalued. And I think the, if anything that you would call ascension would be that we would find out more about our capabilities and not necessarily transfer our capabilities to technology. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know. yeah. Karen, you know, one thing that uh, really has fascinated me uh, lately is the idea that uh, the uh, humanoids that have been running things, the Anunnaki especially, uh, were so uh, bent on their own conflicts that they asked for a, a group that had some kind of uh, unified mind and could be at peace to help them. And that's when they made, they asked the Zeta, the tall Zeta, from, uh, Zeta Reticula, to help and the hybrids that have come out of the uh, stuff done in the 80s and so forth are among us now and there are diamond children that are showing us that it is a diamond and that there is hope and that we've really been blessed by these adapted children who are among us now and interbreeding and so i don't know if that's true or not but i sure do like it as a possibility we we'll probably need some compensation uh, intervention to compensate for the damage being done to us by, as they continued on developing these mind control programs, they began to work on a, a lot of different frequencies of control. So mm-hmm. uh, the food we eat, the, uh, the GMOs, the chemtrails, all of that is trying to cripple, basically, the frequencies of the human instrument so that we are just kind of not very functional. We're, we're fixed physically not very functional, and mentally we are controllable because we aren't thinking our own thoughts. We're always looking to that side of ourselves. Uh, you know, that, that was one of the interventions, the negative interventions of the Anunnaki was to kind of make us part of us ser- servile. And I think the Enlil Inky story was so enlightening to me. Because I did see that some of us are, you know, there's some people, they just wouldn't know what to do. Somebody didn't tell them what to do. They've been conditioned that way. And other people, and they love structure, and they love that hierarchy pyramid thing. Um, Other people uh, are self-directed and ready to, you know, be, I call them free-range humans. I think Inky wanted free-range humans, you know, uh, (laughs) to run around and do what they do. Let's see what they do. You know, yeah. you're curious. <laughs> and that's you know, it's it's the underutilization of the wisdom of of the feminine that caused basically the peaceful society that Nima had generated all over Eurasia, uh, uh, at, where there was uh, free trade and women could be do any uh, thing, and it, and it was peaceful and there wasn't war and there wasn't slavery. And so that's exactly the hierarchy that puts uh, men above women is what's crippled us from ever having uniform 
empathy for everything and everyone on the planet and for the planet itself. Yeah, that was a huge part of the my, my cult was in a church thing where they were really harping on the submission of women, uh, women to be silent. I know people who've been in the fundamental circle kind of know what I'm talking about, to be subservient to the husband and to not work outside the home, which didn't become practical economically over time. So that's sort of, that, that, but this is their ideal, you know, with the 1950s of Stepford family, you know. And I think, I really believe that the mind control that was brought into my church was an experiment as a, Counter, it happened right at the time, right after the 1960s youth movement and women's movement was a big threat to this, these uh, patriarchal fundamentalist types. And they were very connected to all of this clandestine research that was going on. So they kind of focused some uh, mind control ideas specifically to counteract that in these circles. And, and I know it's a kind of weird thing to think about, but that. But I think the uh, recruitment of an, uh, like, my, for instance, my father was in recruitment to go to the FBI for his college. I think that there's a lot of um, interaction between patriarchal stuff and um, between uh, what they were saying. And, and they, you know, they capture it in a way that makes you feel like, oh, it's a benefit, like this is a natural form and function of a female. Um, and, you know, the, you know, you know, they're harping on it all the time, every week, of course, because you've got to go to church twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday, and did ladies Bible class, all these different things that they had us do to continually reprogram. And, you know, it's kind of spiritually boring, though. I have to tell you, when you're just going there to just be reprogrammed, I think people are somewhat spiritually bored. And I think one of the side things that happens was that people were, uh, you know, gossiping. Um, there was a lot of controlling going on. Um, there was an actual pedophile ring in my uh, particular uh, the church that I grew up in. Um, so, I mean, there was a lot, of, you know, if you tell the line and you look good and you sound good, then some mischief sort of happens because you're not, now you're trying to figure out a way around the rules. You can look good, but you don't have to be good. Um, so we, at the top of our power pyramid of our church, uh, we had powerful men involved that, 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 you know, predated on women and predated on children. Of course, a lot of that's coming out in the news right now. Uh, the Me Too check. campaign and all. Janet, check Skype chat. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, sh okay. Let's bring her on. <laughs> uh, so, Karen, do you, uh, let's, you can stay on. We're going to bring on Susan Hansen. And she's calling in from New Zealand. Um, and let's oh, talk about. That'd be great. Yeah, she's wonderful. She and, has um, joined us. Hi, oh, there. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. hi. Welcome. Sorry for the Thank mix you. up. I'm sorry. But, uh, oh, that's okay. You're here with uh, Karen, Christine, Patrick, Janet, Karen, Lesson, and Dr. Sasha, Alex, Lesson. Um, and everybody say hi to. Um, Suzanne, I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do five things at once. I'm gonna. Oh, Suzanne! Hi there. I'm really. So so sorry. I'm a you. bit late. I've had an injury and I was having some physio on it. Oh my goodness! Okay? Sorry to hear that. Are you okay? Are you yeah, I'm. Okay I'm now? okay. I've got a compressed disc, but I'm sitting comfortably. So I'm just apologising that I'm somewhat late. Oh, uh, we're glad you're here. So let me tell our listeners a little bit about you. I'm just pulling up the bio. Here we go. So Suzanne has a wonderful uh, book called The Dual Soul Connection. Is that that's a hard one for me to say? The Dual D U A L Soul S O U L Connection. And so Susie had a 28-year professional career in education, school teaching, and counseling. She's been actively involved in UFO research and sighting investigations in New Zealand for 42 years, and is the founding director of the UFO-focused New Zealand Research Network, established in 2000, a nationwide organization. Uh, Susie, as a director of UFOCUS, 
New Zealand, Suzy lobbied the New Zealand Chief of Defense Forces for the release of the New Zealand Ministry of Defense UFO files, which occurred in 2010 and 2011. And Suzy has lectured internationally at conferences and seminars since 1997 about both New Zealand UFO sightings and her own alien contact and interaction experiences. She's lectured in the USA, Denmark, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, her, let's see, she has a book called The Dual Soul Connection. At age 20, Susie Hansen's life changed on the lonely country road. In broad daylight, her car was engulfed by a massive ball of white light, resulting in 90 minutes of missing time and the unfathomable experience of waking after dark. This riveting experience led her to, to discover uh, an alternative reality time spent with extraterrestrials on board their craft since childhood and in fact since her inception as a soul the dual soul connection the alien agenda for human advancement uniquely combines absorbing details of the lifelong alien encounters of ufo researcher and experiencer susie hansen with scientific examination by dr rudy shield emeritus ex astrophysicist harvard smithsonian center for astrophysics and Hanson and Dr. Shield address such issues as alien culture, spirituality, and consciousness alongside scientific concepts of advanced physics and organic conscious technology, all within the framework of Hanson, Hanson's contact with these non-human species. The book outlines human participation in complex alien programs and assist in advanced humankind and Hanson's experience of dual soul identity is central to this positive agenda. Okay, so welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Yeah, clear empirical approach gives the fullest description of how this off-planet civilization seeks to prepare us for contact and answers the why questions by descri describing in detail the how. Okay, it sounds fascinating. Thank you. Welcome um, to, to the show. And um, before we start, uh, Sasha, uh, do you have anything to say? Susie, uh, this, uh, yeah, I, sh I sure do. You know, Susie, I'm, I, you know, I got, you know, I got that you are part of several ambassadors that have been coming through with very clear health for humanity from extraterrestrial sources. We educated, prepared for your ambassadorship, and so I got who you are, and my listeners are getting who you are, and we're so excited to have you on our show. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So go ahead, Susie, and start uh, telling us your story because this is a new audience. I know you've been on uh, another show with uh, with me and um, T.J. Morris, but this is a different show. Go ahead okay. and tell us. Okay. Well, um, I, I guess my my experiences that I recalled initially started in childhood. Um, but it was much later that I realised I'd, I'd actually um, I'd actually been communicating with these um, entities since um, before my reincarnation on this planet. But we'll go to that perhaps a little later. So I had these um, memories in childhood of of dreamlike memories and waking at night and seeing these uh, glowing beings, glowing figures by my bed. At that stage, they didn't show me their facial features or bodily features, whoops. Um, maybe because they didn't want to frighten me. Um, so I saw these golden entities, golden silhouettes, I call them. Um, they were small, so uh, it, they didn't fit any of the, the concepts that I'd been provided uh, in Sunday school of angels or anything like that even though my mother said well they're probably guardian angels or spirits of family members who have come to look in on you um, remember this was back in the 50s and 60s when all good families in New Zealand went to church on a Sunday and Sunday school however um. to me um, they felt very different uh, I couldn't really as a child identify what they were except that they were these little creatures or 
silhouettes that appeared at night and I would recall them speaking to me and I can recall re replying but it wasn't through the voice or my mouth um, it was through thought what I now of course as an adult recognize as telepathy or consciousness mm -hmm. and they would usually say they were going to take me somewhere um, and I don't remember anymore at that stage then I would remember being being put back into bed being told to go to sleep and I would pretty much do so immediately probably um, they they created that situation um, mm -hmm. and the next day I would often remember this or I would remember um, in a dreamlike fashion being in a white room being taught to do things with my mind seeing unusual things which as a child in New Zealand I couldn't identify but I could still describe it to some extent um, throughout my mm -hmm. teenage years not a great deal happened I don't have a lot of memories of that time and I can only assume that either I wasn't recalling them or um, because you know uh, as a teenager and teenagers tend to be focused on many things including ex external exams at school so maybe I was just left alone for a while to, to grow up I don't know um, but the next memories that occurred were in my early 20s and and um, Janet has mentioned one that's that I is mentioned in my bio about when I was 20 and my car was in, engulfed with a, a light by a light and I had some missing time and that was my reintroduction shall we say to these kinds of memories and contacts and from there it stepped up very quickly and these things were happening quite frequently um, leading on into my 30s and into my 40s where I had increasing memories of what was taking place and was able to describe in quite, de quite some detail on some occasions and on other occasions I would just recall beginnings and ends or snippets from the middle of these experiences. Uh, they're still continuing to today and I'm 62 so um, they've just taken on I, th I believe it, a different kind of format or, or presentation as I have come to understand more uh, these experiences have changed somewhat they're, they're much more simple in their format if I can put it that way do they show an increasing uh, peacefulness, hopefulness? Is, are they in a good direction? Yes, my experiences have always been positive. I, I haven't had the negative or traumatic experiences that, um, that are, uh, some abductees describe. I call myself an experiencer or a communicator, which links all different kinds of people who've had contact. Um, mm -hmm. They've been positive and uh, r transformational, but having said that, there have been times when I have experienced extreme fear or concern about it uh, simply because I didn't understand what was going on. And especially when I had two young children and, and I was wondering what was happening and I was beginning to have memories of them being on the craft with me, that was of concern to a young mother. So I did go through stages of of fear and and worry um, but the more I came to understand and recall um, the, the more that fear just faded away completely Wow thank you so thank you Karen do you have any uh, feedback or comments or questions <laughs> No, I love it. I, I, one of the things I've enjoyed is what they tell us experience stories over there doing all the shows and um you know, this is New Zealand. I'm struck with how this is going on all over the world to all kinds of people. I think uh, researchers seem to pay more attention to the pattern of, of contact like that. Um, put it out in Sunday school. I was, I was talking about my religious experiences as well. How did that work? I mean, was it really conflictual with your beliefs uh, that you were raised with, or were you able? How are you able to reconcile that? Well, I didn't really, uh, I never really called myself a Christian. Um, the extent of my uh, contact with Christianity was that um, it was quite normal for families to go along to church on a Sunday in New Zealand in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up. So I used to go to Sunday school. But um, I, I, I never really, I felt, um, the only way I can explain it is I felt as if I was looking at everything around me in those church environments as being foreign to me. 
none of it made sense to me. Um, I felt like an outsider. It didn't feel right that something was telling me what to do and how to lead my life and putting restrictions on me. And I can recall sitting in church with my family on one occasion where um, I, all of the people in the church were going up to have communion in the Anglican church. And I, I was not entitled to do that because, A, I had never been christened into the church unlike my my uh, sibling and B I had not gone through the church's um, uh, right of practice where you come to the age of 11 or 12 and, and you, um, you you have to go through a certain test and you study the scriptures etc and then you are accepted as being able to have communion in the church so uh, on this occasion I was left sitting in my seat in this very large church while everybody filed up to have communion um, and on that occasion I thought well this is good because I don't like this I don't feel as if I fit in here and and I don't even feel the need to be a part of what everybody else is doing and um, not long after that I guess our family for whatever reasons moved away from going to church on a Sunday and uh, and I certainly didn't miss it, and I've never belonged to a church or anything like that ever since. And I have my own personal viewpoint on it. Um, so I guess I, from an early age, I could experience a lot of things that in those days the church thought was very bad, such as being able to see spirit people and um, communicate with them from an early age. And even today, of course, there's, there's a lot of people who have um, quite negative thoughts about that. And so from an early age, I showed these mediumship abilities. Susie, I'll, Sasha, do you have anything to say? And then I'll, I'll, I want to look at the second half of the show. What would you like to say before we go back to the show? Um, okay, just that uh, this is really a great. We're really getting a chance to uh, really look at the possibility that uh, extraterrestrial contact and help is being systematically offered to us in a way to ambassadors like Susie, and we have a chance of reaching out in empathy with everybody and with the planet, and that it's possible. And it's just like, uh, uh, tell us more. You're giving us hope. Let's hear it. <laughs> Yes, wonderful. And I wanted to talk about what you, what do you mean by the dual soul connection, and um, also the, uh, the description of how this off-planet civilization seeks to prepare us for contact, and answers the why question by describing the how. So, the dual, dual soul connection and how we're being prepared for contact by this off-planet civilization. Back to you, Susie. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, in my book, I write about um, the three waves of volunteer souls coming to this planet. Now, that may sound familiar to some listeners because Dolores Cannon has also written about that. Um, I spoke about that first in uh, 2007 in Sydney, Australia, uh, several years before Dolores put her book out. And um, I outlined at that stage, and I have outlined in my book, um, a, a series of souls that have been incarnating on the planet for the last uh, over a hundred years actually um, and what from my understanding it was ascertained by our spiritual governing body which I have nicknamed the UGB universal governing body of our planet that oversees the incarnation of souls here for various reasons there was concern amongst them but also amongst our cosmic neighbors that we were heading down a very wrong a very bad path partly because of our uh, quite rapid increase in our understanding of technology over the last hundred years through the industrial revolution etc but also um, the spirituality has been decreasing instead of increasing alongside that it's actually been decreasing on the planet as people become more focused on themselves and their own needs rather than having a, a communal or a, a global perspective on, on life on this planet. So um, they formulated these three groups or three waves of souls 
who were, shall I put it this way, recruited from what Dr. Rudy Schild and I call a great field of consciousness, where souls reside or soul sources or soul sparks, whatever you like to call them, reside between lives. It's one of the many places that they reside. So they were recruited and offered certain tasks on the planet that would help speed up our evolution, our development of consciousness and spirituality in order to be able to reach a point where perhaps we can have open contact with our cosmic neighbors or at least be able to use some of the technology which we're currently developing um, with responsibility, compassion and, um, and understanding of consciousness. So um, these three waves have come in at different times and each I was told from the age of eight onwards about these programs that they are running educating humans so people or souls within those three programs those three waves have received um, education as a soul education yes. before they incarnate what their task is to be what the difficulties might be etc etc and then mm -hmm. once they incarnate then they have um, double or triple education so they are taken on they go on board craft in their soul state to to learn more. Uh, they go on board craft as a human to be instructed and taught things, to be tested and put into programs and prepared for eventualities coming up on the planet over a long period of time, over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea is not to come in as as an as an alien race and take over and tell us what to do and enforce anything upon us. The whole idea behind these three programs of incarnating souls or three waves is to create change from within. We have to do this ourselves. This is part of our soul learning. That's why so many of us are here at this time. We have to make that change ourselves. It cannot be enforced upon us because if it's enforced upon us, it's not learned. We actually have to learn it ourselves and make that progress ourselves. But to give us a helping hand and a step up. They've taken thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, people on board craft and given them given them this background education um, that that is being utilized in, in their lives and in their own tasks that they're carrying out, not only for their personal growth but for that of the planet. And this is right across the board. It's from very people in, in very day-to-day -day jobs right through to scientists and and um, other people within the professions as well and although some people may not remember everything that they've experienced there are many who have and those are the people who are in the group that's going to be speaking out communicating with people as I and many other experiencers have done um, so what I find difficult is that many researchers on on the speaking circuit today don't understand a lot of the things that experiencers are talking about and I think many of them give it their own flavor or their own little uh, pet theory is developed and and I think in many ways some of those researchers are leading us away from what experiencers are trying to say and trying to convey not all of them there's just a handful of people who are doing that and and I think that's unfortunate but um, the, where the dual soul comes in is that um, certain souls who've been recruited, shall we say, for these purposes, for these waves, have been, shall we say, taken aside and offered um, an interim step, what I describe in my book in a chapter called Soul Origin as an interim step. So they are offered the opportunity to work with an alien species by having a an, a grey identity, and in my case it's a grey species, positive species of grey, a grey um, part of their spark of consciousness mm. melded to mine as when I was a soul before I incarnated. So this consciousness blended electrically and consciously, if you want to put it that way, with mine before I incarnated. So that dual soul is able then to to take part in things on the craft, activities on the craft, not only as I've already described as a soul or as a human, 
but also as a grey. And many experiencers describe how they go onto the craft and they recall quite clearly stepping out of their human body and going and doing healing activities or other activities using technology as a grey. And this has been very much misunderstood by some researchers over the years and, and not fully understood by many experiencers. But this whole idea of the dual soul explains how this can take place and how the this form is able to manifest. And in the future, we may understand more about how we as humans and as souls can manifest things. I think we're just beginning to get some inklings of this now. And if we look at some of the technology that's being developed worldwide in universities and um, in scientific research uh, facilities throughout the world, we're looking at very much moving towards consciousness and telepathy as being the key to the technology. So a lot of what people learn on the craft and what they experience in, in a grey form or a human form is to do with this development of the consciousness and bringing the human consciousness up to speed. Because if in the future we are going to be able to openly communicate with our cosmic neighbours, we are going to have to have this greater understanding of consciousness because that's how they operate. That's how their technology operates, their societies operate, their communications operate. And we're a long way from that still. So the whole idea of these three waves of souls coming in and the dual soul connection is to ra help raise this consciousness and to help people to become more aware of what we can be and, and the direction in which we're heading. Wow. Well, that reminds me Thanks. of a couple things. So. I strongly identify with uh, the Anunnaki, and perhaps there's something in me that has a dull soul that is part Anunnaki. My um, one other girlfriend identifies with the Greys and the Anunnaki, so it might be more than just a dull soul, but we could be um, a part of many different races, races and species, or however you want to call them. Um, the information by Dr. Michael Newton Institute, where they took people, about 30 to 40,000 people were um, regressed into their life between lives state, and there they uh, stated that many of them had uh, lifetimes simultaneous, because time is illusion I'm here, in the third dimension of physical human earth, and um, they simultaneously exist on other planets in other forms, so that would uh, concur with that. And then the whole thing about the these ambassadors coming down, there's a wonderful book, it, it's kind of, the, the title, I wish it would have been different, it was called The Gaia Project 2012, The Earth's Coming in Great Changes, but it talked about these um, souls that volunteered to come down into the Earth, so everybody here on the Earth who's here has volunteered to come down here, um, and so what they're creating is a a virus, kind of like an antivirus to this uh, evil uh, paradigm that exists throughout the cosmos. And so we're all going to become enlightened and conscious and get it by being in this cycle of birth, left, life, death, birth, rebirth, and um, the, the shortness of life and coming in and out of, of this life into the interlife and back again is an acceleration process where we're going to wake up, become conscious by first going unconscious into this paradigm and we get what it's like to kill and be killed and die and and hurt and harm each other and we finally get it on a very deep level because we're experiencing it on a personal level so thank you for well, that yeah. well, Go ahead. it's more than that everybody that just now heard susan has just gone through uh, an expansion of your consciousness what she said is so clean that it's gone in and your intellect will feed it to the rest of you and it will be part of your expansion. Well, thank you, Sasha. So, go ahead. I think there's a lot of people um, who are here to do, uh, to do, to do work and, and um, I think there's a, there are a lot of souls here to, to perform individual tasks to do with their own learning and consciousness as a soul. But I think um, overlaid over that are 
many thousands of people who've come with very very specific tasks to do and uh, frequently now I'm, I'm getting more and more letters from people I received one today from a gentleman in the UK people who uh, know that there's something they need to do and a lot of people are talking about this they feel there's something they need to do but they don't know what it is and sometimes just talking it over um, with an experiencer or a person um, who has some memory of, of soul actions and interactions is is like a trigger and they're able to open something up and um, and make better sense of, of looking back at their life and looking forward to what, what they need to do and what changes they may need to make in their life and the way that they do things. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. So I Karen. want to know a little bit more about how the off-planet civilizations are preparing us for contact and answer the why by describing the how. Okay, well, I've already outlined the, the programs where hundreds of thousands of people are taken on board and are educated and tested as, as the best way I can put it. I've described in my book being in test situations where you are um, you're, uh, you're taught something over a period of time and then you're given a test situation to see how well you've absorbed that or how adept you are and this may be to do with um, using consciousness, uh, it may be to do with healing, it may be to do with technology, your space or wherever your, your interests and skills may lie and then you're tested on it. And there's, it doesn't seem to be any pass or fail up there on the craft, it's more about okay let's use the best your skills the best way that we can and if you don't do so well in this test we're going to put you here because that's another skill that we can develop that you have we'll put you over here and we'll kind of restart you in that area um, these programs are not just run by the greys a lot of uh, I think the greys get a lot of bad press and I'm not saying that there are not negative species of greys out there as many people report but um, but certainly the species that I'm talking about are working closely with other other species and our universal governing body overseeing the, the spiritual development and the incarnation of souls here. And um, the, so there's a great deal of work and planning that has gone into this because this is a momentous thing. We're talking about future contact with another species from beyond our planet. Or, or many species and it stands to reason that if we're going to um, familiarize ourselves with what we need to know before we make that contact then there has to be some program carried out for example look at uh, some of the tribes in the Amazon that have been discovered that have have not had contact with with other with humanity they've been completely isolated possibly for hundreds and hundreds and of years and there has to be a program of familiarization or um, very careful steps taken towards that contact because you have disease to think about you have modes of communication you have um, a, a civilization being foisted on them too soon and what what may happen as a, as a result of that and so the same needs to apply to contact with species beyond our planet. This same preparation must carry on for a very long time to get us to that point where um, we reach that hundredth monkey point on the planet where something that has been looked upon as pseudoscience or imagination or you know kooky etc suddenly becomes the norm and is accepted and is then investigated seriously and I think we're getting close to that point now so this preparation has been going on and it involves technology um, in February of next year I'll be speaking at the UFO Congress in Phoenix and they've specifically asked me to speak about the alien technology that I have used and observed over the years and um, and I think it, it's quite clear that we have a, still have a long way to go before we can come anywhere close to what what they are able to do with their technology. So these are the hows and the whys and the wherefores that I talked about on the blurb on my book. Giving that foundation of the three waves, the the action of the soul, the dual, how the dual soul plays a part in this, and then looking at what is happening on the craft and why people are being taken there. 
for example, in the latter chap chapters of my book, I talk about how they actually um, are putting humans, some of us who've been trained to do this, in front of large groups of people now, taken on in an altered state, these large groups of 250 or more people who are being talked to, lectured to by humans, and they're considering um, survival techniques in terms of possible earth changes coming up and the the ramifications and the repercussions of that for all of us. So all of these things, not just our consciousness, but our living planet, our environment, our ecology, everything is being looked at and prepared for in terms of preparing us in the best way possible. One of the biggest concerns at present, of course, being nuclear concerns. So is... Um is that set in is that set in stone this outcome, or are we all participating in the potentials of where we go? And see, I, well, from my information, I don't think it's set in stone. But what are you getting? No, I don't think it's set in stone either. In fact, that's what the Greys have told groups of humans that I have been with. It's more like an elastic band; it can stretch and contract um, depending on each day how what happens on the planet and how we deal with it. And I think that we're realizing worldwide that there are ways to solve problems that are better than many of the ways that we've employed as a civilization, civilizations over the years. And uh, we're seeing much younger people in their 30s and 40s coming into positions of power. And if you read my book, you'll see that um, I talk about third wave, third wave humans. And these um, are now people who are in their 30s and 40s. Um, who are going to move into positions of power and influence in a positive sense and they're going to be the game changers on the planet at a time when that leadership and that new sense of um, unity and, and global importance is, is at its peak. So if we're looking ahead and we're seeing possible earth changes, we're having people coming in with new ideas and new ways of solving problems which is what we need on the planet at the moment I think we've become very entrenched in the warlike attitude um, but yes I agree Janet the, the Grace selected an analogy that uh, the group of humans I was with could understand at the time and that was a train journey they said you are going to take a train journey from from A to Z shall we say, that's my terminology, but it's how, roughly how they described it. So you know that you're going to reach the destination eventually, but along the way you'll have different people getting on and off the train who may create problems or who may delay the train. There could be something go wrong with the tracks, there could be something go wrong with the train, it could be held up at one station, but eventually you will get to the destination but um, it's the journey that's the important part of um, seeking the best solutions along the way. And I think that's about it. I think what they're saying is very correct. And um, we have to find new ways to deal with, with our problems because what we've been doing so far hasn't entirely always worked. And um, it's about everybody coming on board and changing our attitudes and finding cooperative solutions to our problems. And they said that the, the Earth is a living entity. And although um, there may be Earth changes, how far we progress in our consciousness on the planet between each event that might happen will dictate how severe that event might be. So that was very hopeful to me and it also made me realize that consciousness is not just between um, creatures or humans or entities, it's about the earth and living planets and um, living creatures that have sentience as well. Oh. Yes, and I, I yeah, go ahead Sash, you talk. What did you want oh, to say? Um, uh, yeah, I, I really uh, feel what you're saying. This is really a time to uh, feel from your heart, just to allow any imagery that uh, you hear that we're getting. Over, and I just want to say this is Revolution Radio, and the, the, I listen to the spot between how angry everything is. Well, you don't have to come from anger because at the 
base of anger is just the need for appropriate assertiveness. That's all. Anger can be turned to appropriate assertiveness. And so that I think what we need to do is not dichotomize, but we need to re reach out and empathize, universally feel each other in some very profound way. And yes, I think we've gotten to the place where AI even can help us uh, in a spectacle that everybody can understand. But I really think it's here and it's possible. And I'm so excited to hear what you're saying, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha. So, what was I going to say? Um, oh, so we were at a, a weekend, two weekends, and working with a lot of young people, and I came away feeling so hopeful. Um, during that, I, I got uh, some information that there was something troublesome going on back home, but I, I just focused my attention on uh, good things and positive things and light things and conscious and spirituality and by the time I came out of this two weekends of people focused on the same the issue that I was I had to go home and I dreaded going home to face which was promising to be very difficult and uh, stressful had disappeared had <laughs> gone away and I thought wow that was magical but I think um, if we do shift our focus because we do we co-create all this and we find ourselves in a negative uh, down spiral uh, what i what i was given by my extraterrestrials is they showed me 24 potential future history multiverses roads that we could travel and at the very end of, and some of them were very um, you know, just detrimental to everybody. There was a complete annihilation of humanity and the planet blows up and that was the worst possible scenario. And then there was everything in between over to the best scenarios of total utopia. And at the end of showing me these 24 different timelines, they said, which one do you choose? And so I went, wow, I'm the chooser? Yes, you're the chooser. And so I chose one that was... Um, you know, it still had stuff to do, so we weren't sitting there bored to death. So, um, I, I'm hopeful that that's what we have. We have choice, and um, that we choose, that we that we realize that we're going down that dark path, and just stop, just stop everything, pause, and, and start with imagining it. Imagine you're in a positive time, time, and that actually because of where we are. In the, um, the the you know in the uh, yugas right through the galaxy through the universe, where we are in time and space, that actually happens quite rapidly, much faster than it did even, you know I was born in fifty four fifty years ago, it, it just feels like it's happening like overnight that type of thing. So, what do you think about all that? Me. <laughs> yes, you. Oh, okay. you. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I agree, and um, I agree with your comment that we co-create um, our our environment. We co-create what's around us, and and I think so many more people are becoming aware of the power of their thoughts, the power of intent, um, and certainly on the craft, many of the activities revolve around understanding the power of intent and how the power of intent can fly a craft, the power of intent can manifest something, the power of intent can cause, can create the physical body to disintegrate and, and reform in, in a different form or back to the same form. And um, and I was told this, this is the sort of thing that humans will be able to do far into the future. So um, they're not going to make a comment like that if they think we're going to annihilate ourselves. So obviously they have hope for us as well. I know they have great hope of, of these programs I've talked about um, being, being activated and, and being successful. But certainly um, co-creating in a positive way is, is a very important thing for people to understand and, and to remember, Janet. Yes. Wow. So you're going to be uh, well. You're going to be sharing this at, at the UFO conference uh, Congress. Uh, people can get get you in person, right? When is that? That's right. It's the 14th, oh. 14th to the 18th of February in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, at the UFO Congress, and I'll be speaking about um, 
consciousness and technology, use of consciousness and technology on the craft. I won't be speaking about the three waves and um, the more spiritual side of things. They've particularly asked me to speak about what I understand about the technology and the corroborative evidence I've found for that. But it involves um, spirituality and consciousness in the same way and power of intent. Those are all inextricably tied together when you're talking about their technology. Well, I think that the, uh, the real solution to this dilemma is hearing more from the experiencers. And a lot of the conferences still do a lot of nuts and bolts. So congratulations for being invited to Contact in the Desert, which does occasionally uh, feature like maybe one experiencer each year. <laughs> and uh, everybody a, else is nuts and bolts. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to the UFO Congress, not, not Contact in the Desert. Um, but, no, I'm sorry, uh, UFO Congress, that, sorry. Yeah. I, but, I, um, I'm just... I, I do agree with you that, um, and I've written an article about this recently actually, the changing role of researchers in contact research because um, right. I think that when, when the whole uh, contact arena started to be exposed with some of the early researchers like um, Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, John Mack, etc. and many others. Um, we didn't have a textbook for it, we didn't understand it, um, it was quite new, quite frightening, a lot of people, abductees were talking about quite negative and traumatic experiences and um, and I think the role of researchers then was to actually you know, talk to people more in a counselling aspect to reassure people because those researchers were learning the ropes at the same time. Um, but now I think you've got more experiences like myself, Travis Walton and Sherry Wilde and others who are perfectly competent speakers and and who I think we have a, a reasonable understanding of of what's going on. And and so I think that it's important that the role of researchers changes now rather than just um, you know, talking to a few people, a number of people, and putting together what what the researcher thinks is happening. I think it's very important to hear from the experiencers themselves, because many of many experiencers, like myself and the ones I've just mentioned, we've been in this a long time. I mean, I've been in this 62 years, um, so I think it's very important that we convey material ourselves as much as possible, and researchers take on more of a supportive role rather than a leadership role. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I, you know, I, I would, I would just like to anyone that felt uh, that they were in the third, in the way of uh, people that uh, are coming to bring uh, love and support to the planet to just feel that archetype resonating as the fractal is getting more and more large in your consciousness right now. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wonder how we can bring this about because it's such a long, slow shift. You've been in it, like you said, 62 years. I've been in it since the beginning of the lifelong experience or contactee. I've spoken at a couple events, but, you know, some of these people are getting invited back year after year. Steve Bass is coming back. For many years, Linda Moulton Howe the only woman that's been on these planets. Uh, I mean these panels. I'm sorry, and so, um, so yeah. How can we really break through here? So you're going to go in with some of the technology that you've seen. So that's they they figured out how to do that. So you can appeal to their audience by doing some nuts and bolts stuff. What technologies you've seen? What technologies have you seen? Well, I think it's um, before I talk about the technologies. I think it's more the fact that. Um, that I've spent a very long time trying to address the criticism that skeptics and scientists, some scientists and a lot of other people in the public make and that is that well you people have had experiences it's all in your head or you've got a vivid imagination or you're a hoaxer or you want to make money or all of those kinds of negative uh, attitudes towards um, the accounts mm -hmm. of experiencers and abductees but so I have tried to um, approach my experiences in a more investigative way, having 
one foot also in the New Zealand sighting investigation in New Zealand for many, many years. Um, I use the same principles really to to address my own experiences. So I have revisited the places where things happened. I've talked to witnesses, talked to people who lived in the areas. I've really gone into um, the, the nuts and bolts of my contact experiences, if I can put it that way. And what I have found is quite inconsequentially, quite unexpectedly, I have come across people who are able to describe something that I have seen in the way of technology in in exact description and I think that the best way for experience one way for experiencers to to put across that credibility card to the public or anyone else is to actually have that corroborative evidence that someone else on the other side of the world you've never met never heard of has seen the same and used the same piece of technology as you so um, I think that's one of the aspects that I will be really pushing in my speech along with the fact that in order to operate much of the uh, technology this the spirituality and the consciousness is a very and power of intent is a very big part of it and that's why we have this need to raise our consciousness because we are trying to develop much of the same sort of technology all bite in a in a less sophisticated form at present but we will reach that point and if we don't have that elevated spirituality or consciousness to deal with that technology then it, we go down could go down that same track of misuse using it for money mm -hmm. using it to harm each other this there has to be this positive slant on this potential technology so that's what I will be putting across um, mm -hmm. at the Congress Wow you know, I would just like to say, as, as sort of along the lines you were uh, speaking, Carolyn Corey talked, got a bunch of experiences who didn't know each other from anything, who saw some kind of symbols or on a board or on in the sky or something, and she just put them up on a uh, projection, and people then uh, said aloud their associations, and they all had the same associations. And there's some kind of galactic. Uh, remembrance of them being in a classroom and the, we keep getting the same story from so many different mm -hmm. uh, sorts uh, and the, uh, somebody else, it was Russell Brinninger, had just gone through this mathematics of well, you know, of all the t uh, hybrid experiments where people with fluids and uh, flesh was taken, it, that's been over for so many, the hybrids are among us just so thoroughly, they are hope, They're, these are the children that are adapted that can Think, empathize. That's what the grays or the zetas have to give us is the ability to feel each other, to be able to have a, a group mind. But and what we have to offer, and we got something really cool too, which is individuality also. And you know, I yeah, I really think it's uh, the other species are groovy too, but we so are we. We got a lot to offer. That's what I think. Yes, I agree entirely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was just going to say one of one of the technologies yes. that I saw was this. It was like um, images projected uh, telepathically into, I guess, my mind or something. I was seeing things in my mind's eye, as well as there was a uh, there was a large screen in front of me with images there. But I was not only seeing, I was feeling, I was hearing, I was, um, you know. They're, all the senses were awakened as they showed me the 24 different multiverses. Have you ever heard of that technology? Anybody else experiencing that technology? Uh, yes. Um, are you talking about the screen or the fact that you're able to see it in your, in your consciousness? Right. They, they used the screen to appeal to my little human self. I was right. a young child. Uh, when I was there, I was my eternal being, so I, I was like out of the veil of forgetfulness and aware of who I was in my totality, you know, my total form of the continuum. And uh, then they were showing, or giving this experience, which was uh, like I was immersed in the process, and all my senses were awakened, and I saw, and I heard, and I smelled, and I felt everything that was going on in these different timelines, these different futures. The potential future for myself. What she was dead. 
Pardon? No, this, this was the, when I was alive. No, this is that was another experience. This is when I was four. And I was I was teleported instantly up to the the mothership wow. and uh -huh. taken to a room where they showed me all these images. So, have you ever heard of that technology? Yes, um, I, I write about that uh, um, quite frequently in my book, actually, where um, you even to the extent that where as a child they were able to what I call extend me to an adult perspective so if they wanted to put something into my consciousness that I would understand at a deeper level as a child but be able to understand better and manifest when I was an adult they would extend my my level of maturity or understanding is the only way I can really describe it mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. as an eight-year-old child, they were pumping huge amounts of detailed information about these three waves into my mind, and then they just closed it off, and, it w and I understood it at the time, and then they just closed it off, and it was like my mind went back to the eight-year-old child again. But for that brief time when they were pumping all this information in, I was understanding it as I would do as an adult now. Um, so yes, they awaken all the senses and, you know, the senses are all topsy-turvy, aren't they, Janet? They're not just, you know, your hands touch things, you know, smell things. You get all these, these cross-references that um, can be quite mind-blowing. And, and I think um, it's things like this, what you've just described and what I've experienced too, that would be overwhelming for the vast majority of humans if they were cut to come and land on the White House lawn now we're just right. not ready for that it would just blow people's minds you know unless you've you've been led and developed and worked and evolved towards that understanding it's the it's just too much great and I, as a soul I'm more than human so that preparation began before I took this human uh, you know, incarnated yes. into this human avatar, and otherwise, I, I I don't think I could have handled it. And yes. I had several near-death experiences on top of uh, non-stop, continuous uh, interactions with extraterrestrials. And each time I died, I became more psychic and conscious and aware of the continuum. And they actually showed me. I wonder if you heard of this. Um, I had a near-death experience, and I was I was actually dead. And it's a, it's very similar to where you go when you're on board ship. It's a very a very similar vibratory frequency, dimension or whatever. But I was uh, dead, and they showed me how to fix my body. I had been um, strangled, and my uh, throat was uh, crushed or something. So they uh, they taught me, or they showed me, and I actually did it myself. But they showed me because uh, I had made the decision to come back into my body. And continue in this life because I have a mission here. I'm I'm here for this time, and, and actually we'll probably meet in at the uh, UFO Congress because Sasha and I are going. We go over here. We've gone since uh, for the last ten years or so. So, um, right. yeah. So we'll meet and we'll be able to look at each other soul to soul, and we'll probably uh, I use the old term grok a lot more. A lot of times when experiencers meet face to face. They start getting more and more information, so um, yes. I look forward to actually meeting you. Yes, I look forward to that too, Janet. Yeah, so uh, have you ever heard of anybody being able to repair their body and rejoin it? Um, yes, I don't know about rejoining it, but um, I have seen uh, people being taught to heal, self-heal, and um, I on one occasion I was actually shown um, not just the energy field around a person but the energy field within the body that was very interesting um, and so I think that um, these are things that we're moving towards in our own technology some of the stuff I will be talking about Janet is um, medical type technology and um, I have talked to since my book came out I've talked to a number of scientists two neuroscientists and um, astrophysicist, Rudy Child, of course, who contributed to the book, but theoretical physicists and physicists have been writing to me, um, asking questions and talking to me about 
some of the technology I describe and my understanding of how it works or what is required of it. For example, um, um, I've just had to have an x-ray on, on my spine because I had a compressed disc. And so we have what is quite archaic um, medical technology if we look at what they can use on the craft. And on one occasion on a craft day, I was placed on a bed, uh, on a shelf bed, underneath a big round circle on the ceiling. And then they touched a little screen and down from that circle on the ceiling came this beam. Now I don't, I wouldn't call it light, I wouldn't call it energy, it was something combined or something in between formed a perfect circle over my body but but within that circle just by touching the screen and changing the frequency you could see for example all of my bones in that circle you could see all of the ligamenture you could see all of the vascular structure etc so just um, with a touch they could change it they could they could bring it up on a screen, they could rotate it around, and we are just beginning to do that ourselves with our medical technology. Um, so that was back in the 80s and 90s. Okay. So um, I think there's a great deal that we will be able to learn in the future and develop that, that is along the lines of self-healing and less invasive forms of medical um, uh, treatments. Yeah, what we've got discovered by interviewing uh, whistleblowers that have been in the secret space program is that we human beings actually have many of these advanced technologies. We have interviewed people that have, um, they've been in this uh, the kind of war that was going on for a period there and they sometimes they would get their arms or legs cut off or, or they were severely wounded and dead and they were revived. and. Uh, they had uh, they laid down on the table and their arms grew back in three hours and uh, all kinds of healing. And at the end of that, uh, this was Randy Kramer. He said, "Well, they they actually told me that I did it myself. So this this ability to to do this level of healing, including re regenerating limbs, is something that we have within our own DNA. And, and there's 256 strands of DNA that have been turned off." So somehow the super soldiers were able to turn on that ability, but at first they, you know, made them believe that this machine was doing it. But we actually have that ability, and Randy regenerated his arm. Plus, there's a 20 back program where many of the super soldiers are getting uh, reversed in age back to their 20s, or, or you know, a much younger age, and then they are able to serve for another 20 years. So, have you? Um, look into any of those uh, reports. Yes, I have. I was just reading about that the other day, actually, Janet, and um, what saddens me is that I have no doubt there are some phenomenal um, technologies that are, are, have already been developed and are in existence, And, uh, and I, but I have to question why the general public is still suffering and not able to take advantage of these or to learn how to operate them. Because this would be part of our slow progress towards moving more and more in that direction and so that it becomes part of our everyday lives and covers so many more areas of our lives. Um, my concern is that some of these technologies are, are being developed for the wielding of power rather than, right. for, rather than for the betterment of, of people on this planet or, or entities and creatures on the planet. Right, so it seems to be uh, power manipulation, control, greed, you know, keeping the wealth in the hands of the few and the rest of us impoverished in a, in a kind of corporate economic slavery. So that brings to mind, is there going to be some kind of assistance or intervention at some time from our um, kind and loving extraterrestrials, the one that support us awakening and and joining, I always say, use the analogy, you, joining the Federation of Planets, Love and Light. Uh, have you, do you have any information on that? Is anybody going to wake up this world and stop this insanity? Well, I think that's what the three waves is all about, but um, it, it's, it really is dependent on, on how many people kind of wake up and, uh, and start making those changes. And I... I don't like to predict things but I did say in my book that I feel that in the next five to ten years we're going to have so many more people coming forward 
Um, as things open up, more and more people are going to come forward talking about their experiences, and I think that a lot of them are going to be in my age group and the older age and older. Um, and they will be, this will have its advantages because they will be grandparents and parents and, um, you know, community members. They'll probably be in business or they'll have um, well developed uh, reputations or professional lives or, um, you know, work experience, long work experience. They'll be well known by people. And once you get, you know, granddad starting to come out with his experiences, well, firstly, the whole family has to say, well, look, granddad's just been this great guy all these years. If he says this, it must be true. And you're going to have a lot more people feeling the freedom to speak out as the subject opens up more. And um, that has to have a, a ripple on effect. Uh, I do have hope. I know that the ETs have uh, taken, you know, vast amounts of specimens from the planet that they are preserving. So even if we don't help ourselves and we end up in a rather precarious situation, um, they can, and we destroy the planet in some way, uh, life on the planet, they can reseed it. And, um, and if humans annihilate themselves or reduce their population, then planet Earth will be quite happy about that. And planet Earth and <laughs> creatures on it will just carry on as if nothing's happened. And um, we are actually right. a species that is not needed. And I think that most humans don't realize that. They see themselves as being superior to the nature world. We're not. Um, we are the ones that are dispensable. Yeah. So we're running out of time. Uh, Sash, final words, and then back to you. Yes, uh, yes, I want you, uh, those of you who have had visions of peace, who dreamed of peace, you just remember where those came from. It's time to reach out in empathy and feel everybody to uh, transcend dualism. We're all part of the same thing. Now is the time for those who love peace and came to do it. This is now. Do it. I love you all. And thank you, Susie. Yes. Yes, Su Susie, uh, tell us how we can get your book. 